I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Synopsys with Kenneth Chang, who's going to talk today about InDesign power rail analysis. Obviously, power is a, a big issue. It's a big issue at advanced nodes. Why do you need to do in-circuit power rail analysis? So what we find from customers is that uh, some of the customers will have um, problems as bad as chip failures. So what they're looking for is solutions, um, including in the last mile, to really be able to pull in the in-rail analysis as early as possible in the flow so that they can solve these type of problems, especially at the lower geometries. And typically this was done much later in the process, right, in the past? Correct, yeah. So what we found also from customers and pretty large set, especially since we've launched this new product, is that they typically do it late in the process because of the availability of the technologies only lend itself to being able to be used late in the process. This becomes more of a problem at, at what, advanced nodes than it did in the past, or is it, is it apply to all nodes? Um, it applies, we're seeing it apply to advanced nodes in particular because of issues of the, uh, you know, where the uh, voltage supply is much smaller. So given that, there's a lot more problems with, for example, margining and just the fact that there's a lot more sensitivity at those lower uh, nodes. Okay, why don't you draw this out for us? Okay, sure. So, let's so what are we looking at here? So what we have is we have a traditional flow, which is on the left side, very simplified, and in design flow, which we're going to talk about in a second here. So in the traditional flow, what you have is when you're doing in, in design rail analysis, so you're trying to do that with, for example, whatever your power sign-off tool is, is you can typically go through your place and route, and then you'll have output, and it goes into the rail analysis tool, your third, whether it's third party or the same vendor, and then you're going into your power fix modes back into the place and route. Now, the problem with this is, number one is these points, number one and two, being able to go take the output out of place and route, get the right stuff into your power rail analysis, and then outputting that so that you can do useful work in, in place and route. Now, in the traditional, uh, traditional flow, the improvements compared to InDesign rail analysis is having everything built in. And the benefits of that is the hurdles of having number one, number two, being uh, transparent to the user. So now that you can do things a lot earlier in your process, and um, you actually don't have to be a power expert, which in this case you do. Uh, and that's what we find in practice what's happening with customers. And as a result of the InDesign flow, you're actually able to do it a lot earlier in the process. For example, you can do pre-CTS, you can do it um, you know, in the floor planning stage, as well as the detail route stage, which is typically where customers are doing their work, but that's really the last mile where you don't want to be doing your thing. The voltage has been going down on a lot of these designs. What, is that, what sort of problems does that cause? So what happens is, as voltage, the power supply is uh, reduced, is we're finding customers who have typically over-margined their design to make sure that they can get through that last mile. They're starting to uh, encounter issues where they actually need that margining, for example, on the frequency side, uh, you know, to account for you know, the noise at the end, and, you know, buffering to make sure that they can close on their design. Uh, in addition, the other part is sometimes they over-design their grids, for example, but then later on they need to, um, they may actually need those resources at the end. So by being able to do the in-design real analysis early, it enables you to reduce the margining needs. And that's what we're really uh, looking at and why at the lower geometries we see a need for um, this type of technology that's very seamless within the place and route. Does overall margin actually decline or is it now you're just spreading it around, you need it in other places? Um, we actually see a tendency towards the need to reduce the margin. So, and that's the, the whole fact is that we're seeing as we engage with customers, they're looking to actually take back some of that margin and work that into their design flow. Um, in particular, as an example, um, for example, like even with the processor cores, uh, as we know, those could be very, very, um, very, very hard in terms of closing and every little bit counts. And so even at the block level, at the IP level, if for example, your most pro pro popular processor cores, we see the need to get every little bit of margin as possible and build that into the flow. So really what you're doing is getting much more exact in how you're designing these chips. Exactly, so what we're doing is we're enabling customers to fine tune their flow and essentially 
um, have you know, design the flow as best as possible with the design to get the best output possible. That impacts not only power, it also impacts performance too, right? Correct, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, by reducing margin, you're able to uh, accomplish um, you know, different things that are kind of related. So margin obviously is not only related to power, but there's also timing, there's also area. How does this fit in with the design rules that are coming out of the foundation? Yeah, so that's a really good question. So one of the things I've been talking about is in design real, real analysis. But in addition to that, what we also offer is the ability to do fixing after getting the analysis results. Now, whether the customer uses the available data that's annotated to our database after the uh, power analysis runs, the um, data can also be used by automated functions that we've been building in partnerships with our customer to further accelerate the fixing, for example, post-CTS, which typically you wouldn't think about, as well as a detail route, which is your last mile. So um, as an example, we have something called PG augmentation. PG augmentation is very specific to the foundry uh, type, the uh, node, and the flavor. Give me a real world example. What's happening out there? How are people using this? So, um, great question. So there's a lot of uh, different engagements and different styles of designs that we've seen from um, looking at entire chips to just the, uh, say for example, as I mentioned earlier, a CPU core that's running, for example, uh, off the top of my head, you know, 1.5 gigahertz, you know, that's at seven nanometer, um, you know, and they have particular hotspots. So what, so what a customer's looking at, for example, when they're taking a look at a block a core or something like that is they want to know how how can I close that as fast as possible um, in my timeline that I need. As an example, one of the customers said one of the timelines is in order to close something like that, it'd be like five days for the whole cycle. So um, how do we achieve such kind of um, very, you know, RTL to GDS, a whole flow executed in that timeline? An example that I mentioned the PG augmentation is to be able to um, automate that, something that would typically take a week easily, into uh, the example I mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, CPU core, was something that, for example, we would achieve more than 5% improvement within 10 minutes, adding, as an example, 10,000 segments of shapes. So that's something that um, customers are looking at at the end of the day. They just want a chip to get out the door. Does it improve if you spend longer with it, or is it basically just solving the problem and then move on? Um, it basically, it's a, it could be an iterative process. The example I gave was one iteration that took 10 minutes to, uh, to improve something, or drop by 5% or more. Um, but it, it's an iterative process, and there are different strategies that can be applied. For example, as I mentioned before, um, you can do things, for example, at the CTS uh, level, or you can do it, for example, at the uh, post detail route. So there's different strategies that can be applied ultimately to um, improve the IR drop because ultimately what the customer cares about is not all you know the specific strategies, they just care about the end result. So as companies design these chips, where do they go next? What happens after this? Yeah, so great question. So we've been engaging with customers since last year, since we announced it at DAC that we were going to partner with ANSYS. Uh, in, blend our technologies so that we get the correlation and, and the great technologies of accuracy and bring it into the uh, physical design environment. Uh, we've been able to execute the analysis, the availability of that is there today. Uh, we've moved towards on the, the optimization side, the fixing side after getting analysis results. And what we see hold in the future is to be able to take the next steps and develop lots of different optimization um, tools essentially so that the customer can get their end results. As an example, as I mentioned earlier, PG augmentation is something that we initially had. We're, we are looking at a number of different IR drop driven strategies, whether it's at the placement stage, whether it's at the clock tree stage, which, whether it's at the detail route stage. Ultimately, what our customers want is they want to have a set of tools that they can throw at the problem to give them the best chance to close their design. And we're working towards just beefing up the optimization stage so that we give the maximum number of tools based on our customer learning so that everybody can benefit. How much does power now fit all the way through the flow versus in the past it used to be a checkoff item? So being a chip designer, 
um, 20 years ago. Power, although people talked about it, you know, in terms of what I'm, what I dealt with as a chip designer and flow developer was, you, you talk about PPA, but usually what would happen is the performance would be, for me, typically was number one in a number of the startups and companies I worked at. Then the area because of the cost, and then the power was an afterthought. You know, whether it's, you know, even though you have bomb materials that you have, for example, figure out the packaging, the heat sink, the airflow, um, those things were manageable. But now what we're seeing, is, especially in the lower geometries and a lot more of this integration, um, you know, happening, um, power is no longer just an afterthought. It has to be planned. And at the same time, you know, people still want that first, first chip success, first pass success. So being able to do that has become just as important today as, um, as you know, years ago where I would say still, it was still at the cusp of, well, you know, we could figure it out later. Today, we're seeing a lot of companies say it's a must have, we need to build power, knowledge into our flow to make sure that our designs not only work well, but they also um, are cost effective. So that's, you know, that's the trends that I've seen. What happens when you get this wrong? Actually, so one of the uh, engagements that we worked with, it was a uh, hyper, it was a super, super uh, CPU core. And uh, in their case, what happened was they had not run any, in, any um, InDesign real analysis because although they had the capability, they had waited for the uh, analysis to be done at the end of the project. And as a result, when they engaged with, with us to um, do some power analysis in, in more in depth to qualify before they taped out, they found out actually their chip uh, was, uh, would not work. So they actually had to, as a result, um, um, do another rev of that chip and basically restart. So that's really the, the worst case cost is you have that surprise and fortunately they were able to do that, but not everybody can do a second rev. Kenneth Chang, thanks for some great insights into what's happening in power rail analysis. Thanks, Ed, for giving me the opportunity today to share this with the audience.